Good morning. Uh, we are glad to have you with us again today. It's an awesome day, and we're in God's Word. I'm always thankful that we can open God's Word together. I have so much growing to do, so much learning to do. I want the Lord to just grab a hold of my heart, yours together. This is about seeing Christ today. I pray that we would see Jesus Christ. Uh, what His plan is for you and for I, how He wants to use you, how He wants to use me. We have a great Savior. So let's look into the Word, and let's see what God has for us to impact our life today, how we live for the Lord today. We're in Revelation chapter 11. What we see here in this chapter is really the separation of the Gospel, how the Gospel separates. We're going to see it in two different ways. And so let's look at that together and see what unfolds. I want you, to, I want you just to just realize and understand Revelation is about Christ, and it's ultimately not only about the program that he's bringing to completion, but the program is the fulfillment of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's good news. And yet within the good news, God has given man the opportunity to choose whether they will step into a relationship with him or not. He leaves you and I with a choice. And that choice that we make in, in our life that we live here on earth, that will impact the, our eternal destiny. How we spend eternity, whether we are with the Lord or whether we are separated from the Lord, whether we belong to the Lord, whether we are excluded from, from relationship with the Lord. So I want us to see today, the Word of God just makes it very clear and gives us an opportunity and extends grace to us. The Word of God, Revelation even showing, he, even in this book where there is uh, judgment and wrath and all that, it simply still is a reminder it is about the grace of God, it's about the love of God, it always is. Romans 5, 8 just reminds us, it's the gospel, it's God's love, God loved us, and it's God's love in action. God doesn't just say, and he doesn't just say to you and I, I love you, for God so loved the world. But he says, I want to show you, I want to show you how much I love you. He says to every unbeliever, he says to every man, woman, and child, I want you to know, to see, to understand how much I love you. I gave my life for you. God showed his love for us. He became sin for us. That's what he did. He took our place on the cross. That is underneath everything else here in the book of Revelation. Even in the midst of the, of the wrath that we are, we are seeing here in this part of Revelation that we're in, Still, underneath that is this reality. Judgment is coming. Wrath is coming. But Jesus has said, yet there is provision for you in Christ. We are without excuse. Every man, woman, and child is without excuse because there is provision in Jesus Christ. See, what underlies everything is this. God loves you this morning. I want you to know that. I want you to understand that. That needs to redefine how you live your life, how I live my life. So it's all about the gospel. Let's see how that's true. Well, the first thing that we see here in chapter 11 is the gospel separates, verses uh, 1 and 2. So let's read it. Let's pick it up. And then I was given a measuring rod, like a staff, and I was told, Rise and measure the temple of God and the altar and those who worship there. But do not measure the court outside of the temple. Leave that out, for it is given over to the nations, and they will trample the holy city for 42 months. We have a gospel here. We have a gospel that separates. There's a distinction being made. It is, it is mentioned in the context of the temple of God. Is this, a, is this a spiritual temple? Is this the heavenly temple that we've already seen here in Revelation chapter 4, 5, and, and since then? Is this a literal, physical temple on the earth? Um, what's going on here? Whatever the answer to that question is, it is about the gospel. And I want you to see there, there is an event here in Revelation that ties directly to the need for a temple, a literal temple, a physical temple in Jerusalem during the seven years of the tribulation. Daniel chapter 9, verse 27 reminds us, The Antichrist will make a covenant with many for one week. For half of the week, that's the second half of the tribulation, he will put an end to sacrifice and offering. So in Jerusalem, there will be sacrifice, there will be offerings being made. On the wing of abomination shall come one who makes desolate until the decreed end is poured out on the desolator. He's going to be dealt with, the Antichrist. But we have the element of the temple here. The Lord affirms in Matthew 24, when you see the abomination of de desolation that's in the temple, spoken of by the prophet Daniel here in Daniel 9, you're to run for your lives. That's what he's saying here. Second Thess Thessalonians chapter 2 Verse 4 reminds us 
The Antichrist will oppose. He will exalt himself against every so-called God or object of worship so that he will take his seat in the temple of God, proclaiming himself to be God. These prophecies, these words, these descriptions remind us there needs to be a literal temple in Jerusalem during the time of the tribulation. Now, Ezekiel chapter 40, 41, 42, 43, give us a picture of a, a grand temple that is coming. But that is a millennial view of the temple in the millennial kingdom. It's not this temple here during the tribulation. Even today, temp, uh, supplies have been gathered, are being gathered for the building of the temple. There are Jews who are committed to being ready when this day comes. Students in each generation are being trained to be ready for the priesthood. That's the reality of some in, in Jerusalem. The question is how? How is this even possible? You know, in today's political, cultural, world climate, how is this even possible? The world as it stands now will completely oppose the building of a temple in Jerusalem. Um, the Dome of the Rock. Many believe that's where the temple is to be built. Some believe it's, it's very close to there. At any rate, it would impact that whole dynamic right there, uh, worship. How is that even possible? If sacrifices are going to be restarted, you can imagine how uh, animal activists are going to come out of the woodwork, would come out of the woodwork against such a public desecration of animals as they would perceive it and see it. How in today's culture is this even possible? That's a good question. Uh, how do we answer that question? Because, because I believe from the Word of God, the reality is there will be a temple. Well, let's look at let's look at the gospel first, as we and we'll come back to this. How, the gospel separates. That's what it does. And the temple is the means by which this is first communicated. There is a distinction of belonging. There is a distinction of exclusion here in verses one and two. We have a measuring rod here in verse one. Um, I was given a measuring rod. That's a reed. It, it's it's a reed. It's a long. It's a long piece of wood, kind of like a, a piece of bamboo. Long, straight, reliable. Those would be used in ancient Israel as as standards of measurement. They were reliable. They were straight. He says, "I'm going to measure the temple." God says, "I'm going to I'm going to measure that temple." To measure is is to say, "I own this." To measure to me, uh, uh, to measure is is how does it how does it stand against the standard of God? Um, and so he's measuring here two elements. One measurement gives us this clear sense of belonging. It says in verse 1, Rise up and measure the temple of God and the altar and those who worship there. This is the holy of holies. This is the holy area. This is the inner court. And so what's being pictured here is, is God is saying, I want, I want to identify, and I already know, I want you to see and to understand, John, there are those who belong to me. They are part of the inner court. They are those of Israel who are being saved. They are those ultimately of, of all uh, peoples and, and languages and tribes that are being saved. But, but here in this picture, it is, it is all specifically also referring to Israel itself. There, there, is, there is a portion of Israel that will be saved. Israel itself will be saved. They belong to me. They are part of this inner court. There is a sense of belonging. There's something that's going to take place where belonging is going to be the result of that action, their choice as a nation Israel. And then he says in verse 2, do not measure the court outside the temple. L leave that out. It is given over to the nations, and they will trample the holy city for 42 months. That, and so we have the outer court of the temple. That is, that is where the Gentiles could gather. They could worship. They were forbidden from going into the inner court and ultimately into the holy of holies. That was for the uh, Jews only. What God is doing now, he's reversing the dynamic of how he's operating with the world today. We are in the church age, the age of the Gentiles. God has, has prohibited Israel from a nation from turning to him. He is now, he is now we are now in an age where he is, he is pouring his favor of grace, of spiritual grace, upon Gentiles so that we can be saved. In this sense, now he's going to return his favor in the tribulation to Israel on the nation of Israel. That's what we take place. This exclusion in verse 2 is the Gentiles. It, are, it, it is the earth dwellers. It's, it's those who refuse to receive Jesus Christ. It is the majority of the people on earth who will, this says here, the Gentiles will trample Israel for 42 months. They will hold Israel under its thumb. They will, they will control Israel for 42 months. That's the second 
half of the tribulation. That's three and a half years. Specifically, three and a half years. 42 months. Do not measure. They're not a part of this. They are under the judgment, the continuing judgment of God. 42 months. And so the temple here sh picture shows, shows an exclusion. Those who belong to the Lord, who have put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Ultimately here in context, not only the Gentiles who we have seen are already being saved, but specifically Israel as well. And then the Gentiles, now there is a distinction being made between Israel who will be turning to him and Gentiles who will be seeking to destroy Israel and ultimately God himself. There is a distinction being made. Another thing that's true about the gospel, not only is there a distinction, but the gospel reveals the heart. That's what it does. And so I want us to see that as we look through the rest of this book. Now, when we come to chapter 11, we always think about chapter 11 being, being this in, in these verses about the two witnesses, these two witnesses. Well, we're going we're gonna to look at that. But under, underlying this reality is simply this. It's about the gospel. And as the witnesses carry out their mission, as they carry out their duty, what they are doing is they bring judgment. They are also proclaiming good news. They are proclaiming the gospel. People are being saved from every nation, from every tribe, but I believe also from Israel. God is softening the heart of Israel. Grace. That's what I want you to see. You cannot read any commentary. You cannot read anything on this chapter without without. All, often, most of the time, it seems like the focus is on this one question. Who are these two witnesses? Who are they? We're going we're gonna to read the passage here in a second. Some would say it's Moses and Elijah. The miracles that they, they perform, the things that they do, are so reminiscent of Moses and Elijah. And, and so they correlate so perfectly in so many ways. Uh, they both appear to the transfiguration of Christ. Enoch and Elijah are two that are, that are held up as possibilities. They, God took them to heaven before they died. Some say, no, that these, again, this isn't literal, this passage. It symbolizes the church. The church is now Israel. We've said clearly uh, that I believe the scripture says, shows us that's not true. And then, or oh, maybe it's someone else. I'm not going to answer that question because I can't. It's not given to us. The answer isn't given to us. That's, that's for your personal study to try to determine who, who you think that might be. Some of these answers right here may be the answer, quite frankly. But that's not the purpose of our time here this morning. Let's look at the mission of these two witnesses, okay? Verse 3 and 4. And I will grant authority to my two witnesses, and they will prophesy for 1,260 days, clothed in sackcloth. And these are the two olive trees and two lampstands that stand before the Lord of the earth. There's a number of things that we see here about their witness, their mission. Number one, they're under the authority of God. I will grant authority to them. You know, we, we're to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. Under the authority, in the authority of Jesus Christ, we proclaim his truth. What they are given to do is under his authority in the name of Jesus Christ. And he affirms that in everything that he allows them to do. They are under the ownership of God. They belong to him. They are his. They are not their own. It says here also in verse 3, I will grant authority to, to my, my two witnesses. You know what? These two witnesses, they belong to Jesus Christ. They are servants of the Lord Almighty, of God Almighty. They are, to, they are here to serve him on this earth and to give the gospel and to proclaim and to show and to reveal the judgment of God. They are operating in God's timeline, God's timetable. They will prophesy for 1,260 days. That's a term specifically here for the Jews. It, it, it implies um, relationship. It implies intimacy. It, 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 it uh, implies relational connection. You see the terms that were given in verse 2 for the Gentiles is 42 months. More vague, but it's the same amount of time. 42 months. 1,260 days, both exactly 300 or th uh, three and a half years. Same same timeline, same dis same length of time that God has given here. So they will they will minister for three and a half years of the seven years in the tribulation. They are under obligation to carry out God's message. We see that in verse three as well. 
They are clothed in sackcloth. That sackcloth just simply, it conveys. It conveys the soberness, the seriousness of the Word of God, of the truth of the Word of God, of the holiness of God, of His holy justice, of His judgment and wrath, of, of the fact that God, the time has come, do not delay. We saw last week, God's judgment will come terribly upon the earth now in the last seven bowls. The time has come. But these, from the seals to the trumpets to the bowls, the time has come. It is serious. You know, for you and I as believers, God puts us on this earth. When we are saved, he puts us on a path, and we are obligated to the Lord to live for him, to declare Jesus Christ. I am to be a witness for Jesus Christ everywhere I go. That's my obligation. That is our obligation together as a child of God, to live consistent with the truth of God's word and to declare it. They are under the power of the Holy Spirit. We see here in verse 4, they are, they are two olive trees and two lampstands. They stand before the Lord of the earth. Those olive trees, lampstands convey a, a light to the gospel. Olive trees convey uh, uh, the, the power of God in their life, the blessing of God, the blessing of God through them to a nation, to people. Zechariah chapter 4, we see this. As he prophesies, he says, referring to these two, I see a lampstand and I see by it two olive trees. These are two anointed ones who stand by the Lord of the whole earth. They are anointed. They are filled with the Spirit. Yes, the Spirit of God has been removed as far as controlling evil, but he's operating as he's always operated. It's even in the Old Testament, he would come upon people for a for a for a purpose for a mission and that's exactly what he's doing here they are spirit and power god controlled now let's look at the power that they have what is their power what are they what is it that's true about them verse five and six and and if anyone would harm them if that was their desire fire pours from their mouth and consumes their foes if anyone would harm them this is how he he, he is doomed to be killed they have the power to shut the sky that no rain may fall during the days of their prophesying and they have power over the waters to turn them into blood and to strike the earth with every kind of plague as often as they desire. They can kill their enemies with fire. They can call down fire from heaven. They can, fire pours out of their mouth. You say, this just can't happen. This is like superhumanish. This doesn't, this doesn't happen. See, God, God enables his prophets, we see in the Old Testament, to do things that are miraculous and supernatural. They have the same qualities and the same ways to deal with sin and sinful people and if and if someone tries to take their life they have the power to defend themselves and to kill the one who would strive to do that basically they are invincible for a period of time they are invincible no one can take their life they can shut off the rain again we see we see prophets in the scriptures, be able to convey and do the same the same thing. They can they can shut off the rain and 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 just bring a desert and bring famine, and they can just do that. And that's an ability God has given them. They can turn water into blood. Have we not seen that in the scriptures as well in the Old Testament? They can use any plague, any any of the plagues of the of Egypt, any plague that they can use, and they can use it as often as they would like. Folks, they're powerful. Not only are they proclaiming the power of the Word of God. Do you know what? The, the Word of God is powerful to change. Enough. It's all we need. You and I don't have any of these abilities. We cannot do any of these things except in prayer um, we can be powerful. But we can't do these things. And yet God is going to even strengthen further and affirm further His authority behind their ministry by allowing them to do this. It'll be a clear signal to the world they're not to be messed with. But here's the here's the here's the thing. They're gonna they're gonna minister for three and a half years. They're gonna have this ability, this power, this voice for three and a half years. They're gonna influence the world, folks. You know it. They're gonna influence the world. The world is gonna hear them. The world is gonna see them, folks. I, I take I take the scriptures literally. I believe this is literal. I believe God is just simply giving us again another glimpse of what He's already done in Scripture, time and time again through his prophets, through those who have been faithful to him in the Old Testament especially, those things are going to come back now and, and be available to these two. Power. Folks, the world is going, to, is going to notice. You know it. 
And they're going to hate, they're going to hate these two. Because they will be in the face of unbelievers with the truth, the grace, the judgment, the wrath of God. And there's going to come a time at the end of their ministry, verse 7, and when they have finished their testimony, we see their demise, we see their end. There is an end. God will allow them to come to an end. Let's read this, verse 7. When they have finished their testimony, the beast that rises from the bottomless pit will make war on them and conquer them and kill them. And their dead bodies will lie in the street of the great city. That symbolically is called Sodom and Egypt, where their Lord was crucified for three and a half days. Some from the peoples and tribes and languages and nations will gaze at their dead bodies and refuse to let them be placed in the tomb. And those who dwell on the earth will rejoice over them and make merry and exchange presents because these two prophets have been a torment to those who dwell on the earth. This is the reality. In, in, in verse 7, we see this. A sat satanically empowered beast will ultimately rise up with the ability to, to conquer them and to kill them. We see that in, in verse 7. Uh, the beast. This is the first time we see that term in Revelation. We see it 32 times. It refers to the Antichrist. He's already been on the scene. Now we're going to see his true nature be identified and who he is and what he's going to accomplish. That's what we're seeing here. He will be, sat he will be satanically controlled and empowered, especially with power in the second half of the tribulation. And he will have abilities that will, that will give him what well, we'll see it. Okay? So this is a reality of what's going to take place um, in verse 7. He will, he will rise from the bottomless pit. In other words, his power will be from the one who comes from the bottomless pit. Ultimately, Satan himself. We see the satanic power and influence behind everything that he does. And then he will kill. He will, kill, he will conquer him. He will kill him. He will kill the two who have been, up to this point, invincible. Because God will allow it. And they will lie in state? No, they will lie in the streets for three and a half days. They're not gonna they're not gonna lie in state and everybody parade by and show respect. No, their bodies are gonna be left to decay. They're gonna be humiliated. The Jewish body was never to be treated this way. It is it is a disgrace. And it is meant to be a disgrace. And it's meant to, to put down in every way. It's meant to humiliate the memory of what they did. It's to honor and to lift up the Antichrist and to show him to be victorious. And for three and a half days, they're simply where they fall, wherever they are in Jerusalem, wherever they fall, they die. Now, it says here in... Um, uh, that the world will celebrate their victory. But no, I, I want to come back. I want to come to that in just a second. It says here in, in verse 8, they are in that great city that is symbolically called Sodom and Egypt, where the Lord was crucified. Well, we know for sure this is Jerusalem. Jerusalem is referred to, symbolically referred to, as Sodom and Egypt. It just reveals the wickedness of, of Jerusalem, of Israel. They, they are no better than the world. They, they are caught up in sin, just like the world is. It's the same place where Jesus was crucified. These two, who minister for the sake of Jesus Christ, will be killed as Jesus Christ was, not on the cross. And they will be dead for three days, three and a half days. It will prove beyond a shadow of a doubt, according to Jewish law, that they are dead. And the world's going to celebrate the world's going to celebrate their defeat here. Um, they're going to rejoice over them. It's going to be like Christmas. It's going to be a hellish Christmas. It's going to be a demonic Christmas. The world will celebrate the demise of these three. And it says here in verse 10 that they will make merry and they're going to exchange gifts. Folks, they're going to be gift-giving across the world, rejoicing. Folks, there's going to be there's going to be a, a release of, of a pagan worship and rejoicing and celebration in a way we've never seen. The world is going to rejoice that these two tormentors have been killed. That's the reality. 
Folks, the, 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 the relief to the world upon their death is going to be so significant. They're going to drop everything that they're doing and celebrate. They have been a scourge to the earth. They put on the news channels every day, all the time. Sometimes the media can get fixated on a person and that's all they talk about. Folks, this is going to be a fixation. And when they die, it's going to be a celebration like none you've never seen before. The world's going to celebrate their defeat. Here's the question. And the text doesn't answer it, but it's important, so I want to, I want to at least try to give some, some element to it. The two witnesses, are they in the first half of the tribulation or the second half of the tribulation? It's kind of an important question. The Lord doesn't answer it specifically in this passage, and we may ultimately never know, okay? Let me just share you my thoughts briefly and quickly. Some would say the witnesses here are in the second half of the tribulation. And so they would say that because what happens right after this is the seventh trumpet sounds. And it leads into the bowl of judgments, which leads us to the end of the tribulation. I would remind you that here and in sections here in Revelation, it's not chronological. That the Lord is, is giving us a chronological flow that what he'll do is he'll step back. And he'll say, okay, let me, let me explain this to you. Let me, let me show you this information. Let me give you perspective. Let me, let me show you what's going on. I believe that's what he's doing here. I think he's giving perspective here, but let's look here. Uh, their judgments, their wrath, their ability to call fire down from heaven fits, fits better as a response after the attacks of the desolation, abomination of desolation. Uh, well, they are, well, they are now on the defense continually because of the because of the um, Antichrist taking over this world specifically. So kind of what you have here is you got a spiritual warfare. The, the Antichrist is calling fire down from heaven and the two witnesses are calling fire down from heaven and it's a spiritual fire war and it's just nonstop. And so that's, that's a possibility in this view here. Three and a half days they're dead on the streets. And so some would say that fits better the, the character simply of people in the world, that they would do this. Um, some see a natural sequence. You have the temple being built, then you have the oppression of God's people, and you have these two witnesses come. Abomination of desolation in these two witnesses. Some see in verse 1, chapter 11, count the worshipers, okay, measure, count the worshipers as those who have fled Jerusalem after the abomination of desolation. But it doesn't make that distinction here in the text. And I may not be right, but I think, I think it's a better fit for the first half of the tribulation. Think about this. In the first half of the tribulation, as, as Jesus explains, and says, let me explain what's been going on. I think the two witnesses are very key to what we've already seen in the, in the first, first half of the tribulation. Let's look at this. Number one, there's going to be a covenant, a seven-year covenant. How in the world is that going to take place right off the bat when the rapture takes place? Well, if, if the two witnesses come on the scene right away and have this kind of impact and have this kind of visibility, they're going to have impact on a world national scene already. And if the Antichrist is beginning to, if the Antichrist is revealed right from the beginning of the tribulation, but he's got to consolidate power, but he's still powerful and he makes political uh, alignments, he might need help to make this ha happen. And somehow they're going to impact and enable the ability for a covenant to be made. Israel's going to have to trust this Antichrist, who they don't know is the Antichrist in the moment because, because of lack of faith, that this is good for Israel and they would have impact on their ability to trust. I'm not saying that that's going to take place. It makes sense. we got 144,000 Jews that are saved. I believe they're saved as a direct ministry of these two witnesses. They are saved and they are sealed and they are used by God to bring people to Christ. And people from all around the world are saved through the ministry of these 144,000 Jews. I believe they are, in, they are impacted directly by these two witnesses in the first half of the tribulation. They are saved because of the witness of two powerful prophets, as it were, in the, in the form of these two witnesses. And they're saved and they have impact. We have Israel being protected in the first half of the tribulation. We have the temple being built. Folks, how does that, how does that happen? How, how does Israel build a temple in the first half of the tribulation? 
within the context now in this world, things have to change overnight when the rapture occurs and the world then allow Israel to do this? How is the world going to allow it unless they are forced, as it were, by the power of God in their presence, by witness and testimony to allow Israel to do that? The witnesses answers that question. Their power, their authority. We also see them finish their testimony and then they're killed. There's a three and a half day celebration after they're killed. But you know what? This doesn't fit the end of the tribulation sequence of events. It doesn't fit. Let me show you why I believe that's true. From what I read, from what I understand, from what I see, they're both on the same timetable. Remember, the beast, we see he will minister 42 months. That's the same amount of time, exact same amount of time as 1,260 days. The 30-day calendar, which the Jews would, uh, were under. Okay? If both are in the second half of the tribulation, this can't work. Let me show you why. Why well, I believe it can't work. In chapter 17 and 18, you have the whole world system is destroyed. Babylon is what it's called. We're going to get there. We're going to talk about it. The world system is obliterated by the judgment of God. The, the framework for how this world operates is obliterated by God. Verse 19, they have the second coming of Jesus Christ, chapter 19. And he strikes the nations with wrath. The armies of the world who have gathered in Armageddon to destroy Israel are destroyed. Folks, it's world death at the hands of Jesus Christ, specifically. The world is, the armies are wiped out. The beast and the false prophet here, at the end of these 1,260 days, at the end of 42 months, are thrown into the lake of fire. When the defeat happens, they are gathered up immediately and thrown into the lake of fire. And after this, there's going to be a three and a half day celebration by the whole world because of the two witnesses who are, who are ministering with and in the same time frame as the second half. This is going to take place? The answer is no. It, it doesn't fit. Because of what happens at the end, end of the tribulation, this can't be the sequence. If they were operating together in the second half of the tribulation, it doesn't fit. In the second half of the tribulation, you're going to have this. The Antichrist, number five here, is going to consolidate power. He's going to dominate the world. He can't do that with the two witnesses here. Because his goal is to kill them, conquer them, destroy them. He cannot dominate he cannot force the world to bow at his feet, to take the mark of the beast. He can't force the world to worship only him if these two witnesses are on the scene doing what they are described as being doing, doing on their time here on earth. Can't happen. Israel flees after the abomination of desolation, second half of the tribulation. In the middle of the tribulation, Israel's going to flee. But if the two witnesses are here in the second half of the tribulation, they don't flee. They're going to stay in Jerusalem. Their audience is, is Israel. Israel flees because of the persecution. Matthew chapter 24 says, when the abomination of desolation comes, takes place, everyone flee. Will they disobey that? It just doesn't seem to be a fit. Okay, let's move on. I believe they will be in the first half of the tribulation. They will affect so many of the things we've already seen. The 144,000, the uh, enabling of the covenant to be made, uh, not that they're behind it, they're not the evil behind it, they're giving Israel the trust to step into the sovereign plan of God for them for those seven years. And yet they will protect Israel. They will enable the temple to be built. And then the second half comes and it unfolds. I want us to close on a positive note here. There is ultimately victory. I want us to see that. They've been killed. They're, they're lying on the streets for three and a half days. The world is celebrating. Then we come to verses 11 through 13. But after the three and a half days, a breath of life from God entered them, and they stood up on their feet, and great fear fell on those who saw them. And then they heard a loud voice from heaven saying to them, Come up here. And they went up to heaven in a cloud, and their enemies watched them. And at that hour there was a great earthquake, and a tenth of the city fell, Jerusalem. 7,000 people were killed in the earthquake, and the rest were terrified, and they gave glory to the God of heaven. The, the second woe has passed. Behold, the third woe is soon to come. After three and a half days, God breathes life into them. Folks, you can, you can imagine the terror that now comes upon them that we see here in verse 11. 
and and the breath of life comes upon and they and they stand up. They didn't stagger. They didn't. Uh, they stood up, and they stood up, and they're being watched, and the world is watching, and they're on TV, and their dead bodies are on TV, and all of a sudden. The, the world is partying and it's a celebration worldwide and people are drunk with victory and people are 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 beyond themselves with with just a drunkenness and a, and a an orgy of celebration and all of a sudden they see on their on their TVs these two stand up and it says here in verse 11 and great fear fell on those who saw Folks, you, you can believe it a, a wet blanket was thrown on the fire. Like they are partying and there's orgies and they're dancing and they're celebrating and they two stand up and folks, it it drops like a pin. It gets as, it gets as quiet as a mouse. And the world stops. And the celebration stops. And terror grips the world. Folks, you can, we can only imagine the scene that takes place here. And there is a worldwide display of victory. And, and a loud voice from heaven says, Come up here. And they are lifted up. Then there's an earthquake. The power of God again. See, now the two are gone. But now God releases his power again. A huge earthquake in Jerusalem. 7,000 are killed. Here's the question. <clears throat> It says here in verse 13. 7,000 were killed in the earthquake and the rest, the, this is in Jerusalem. Look at that catch. There was a great earthquake and a tenth of the city fell. 7,000 people were killed in the earthquake and the rest were terrified and gave glory to the God of heaven. Is there repentance here? Is there a change that takes place here? Right? And the question that's appropriate here why didn't the two witnesses, when they stand up, folks, think about it. Think about this moment. Think about the terror of God upon them, the attention that God has of the world in this moment. Why didn't they then preach, proclaim again? The Lord said in Luke chapter 16, If they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced if someone should rise from the dead. Huh. That's the answer right there. Their hearts are so hard, even in this moment, they wouldn't believe. But the question is, verse 13, and the rest were terrified and gave God, gave glory to the God of heaven. Were they saved? Revelation 16, 9, they didn't repent after the six seals and they refused to give God glory. Daniel chapter 4, we saw King Nebuchadnezzar brought low, lose the ability of his senses to be aware and when he regained them, he gave God glory. He glorified God. Was he saved or not? We don't know. Prophecy. Zechariah 13, on that day there shall be a fountain open for the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem to cleanse them from sin and uncleanliness. Chapter 12, verse 10 of Zechariah. I will pour out on the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem a spirit of grace and pleas for mercy. God's going to gr give grace to the nation of Israel. Is that what's taking place here? Is this a matter of awe and what God has just done? Is it a matter of repentance and salvation? Is it terror leading to, leading to our, uh, a somber awe and respect? Or is it salvation that changes the life? We ultimately don't know, but Zechariah gives us here a clear picture that God will turn the heart of those in Israel. He's still turning hearts today. He's doing it right now. He's doing it today. He will turn their hearts. The second half of this verse says, when they see Jesus Christ, they're going to weep bitterly. They're going to have been turned by grace, and then they will see Jesus Christ for who he is for the first time and weep over the fact that they had crucified Jesus Christ. Here's the ultimate reality. God knows the heart. He knows what takes place here, even if we don't with, with certainty. When Samuel was called by the Lord to, to find a king in David, who was the youngest of his brothers, he looked at all the older ones, but the Lord says, no, don't look at them. He says, don't look on the outward appearance. The Lord sees not as man sees. Man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. God sees the heart. He knows the heart. He knows your heart. You and I have a choice to receive Jesus Christ as Savior, to receive by faith His love, to love Him 
forever in relationship, to live for him because I love him. We have a choice to make, to respond in faith. Is that what takes place here? Yeah, it's quite possible that Israel is turned to Christ here. That the 144,000 have had an impact in the first half of the, of the tribulation, and now this takes place, and the nation continues to turn to Jesus Christ. Whether that happens right here or at the end of the tribulation, that is Israel turning, God will turn their hearts. God will turn your heart if you, if you let him. Will you turn to him and receive his, his son, Jesus Christ, as your Savior by faith? That's the call. That's the question. The two witnesses come. Jesus Christ never leaves himself without a witness. He never has in the Word of God. His people have always had a witness here in the tribulation right now. Right now you are receiving witness about the truth of the gospel. You need a Savior. You need cleansing and forgiveness of sins. You are receiving the truth of the gospel. You and I are to be gospel bearers. We're to be ambassadors for Jesus Christ. We're to be a living letter. We're, we're to declare the good news of the gospel to people who need a Savior so desperately. We are called to be a messenger for Jesus Christ. Will I receive that? Will I do that? Will I love people because I love Jesus Christ so much? Will I love my neighbor as myself because I love the Lord God with all my heart, all my soul, all my strength, and all my mind? Will, will that be the stamp of Christ on my life? That's what he's asking here of the believers. He's asking them to trust him in the midst of adversity and wrath and judgment, to trust him with their lives, to love him, and to walk forward into the uncertainty of life on earth during the tribulation, but with certainty because they now belong to Jesus Christ. You can have that peace and that promise today. I trust that's yours this morning. Thanks for meeting with us today. Thanks for walking with us through Revelation. We're learning together. I don't have all the answers. I don't claim to, but I'm trying to lay before you the Word of God, the truth of the Word of God, so that we can learn and we can grow. Continue to study. Be a student of God's Word. Be a witness for Jesus Christ. And if you've never received Jesus Christ as Savior, do it today. Thanks again. We'll see you next week. Bye-bye.